All right, so we are moving on in the cardiovascular unit, and now we're going to talk about blood vessels. So blood vessels are going to be classifi classified by size and histological organization. And of course, these vessels are going to be so important when it comes to making sure that the cardiovascular system can work together like it's supposed to. The largest vessels you guys have already seen when we learned about the heart, so you're familiar with the pulmonary trunk as well as the aorta. Those things are already labeled on your picture, or at least they should be. So hopefully you have gotten a chance to label those and you can see where the pulmonary trunk is going to move blood to as well as where the aorta will move the blood. When we're talking about arteries, remember, you want to remember this as those vessels that carry blood away from the heart. And then veins, of course, do the opposite. They're going to return the blood to the heart. Now, as we branch down smaller and smaller, because obviously we can't have something as big as the aorta all the way in the fingertips. So as we get smaller and smaller, as we move towards the periphery of the body, then we're going to change names in things. So instead of arteries, we become arterioles. And these are the smallest branches of arteries that can lead into the capillary beds. And of course, capillaries are the very smallest vessels. This is going to be an incredibly important component to understanding how blood vessels work because the capillary area is the area of function where you can do the exchange between the oxygen and the carbon dioxide between the blood and the interstitial fluid. So very, very important. We'll talk about the different types of capillaries that you can see in the body and why they would be in different locations based upon structure and of course function. Manuals are the smallest branches of veins that are going to pick up blood from the capillary beds and of course Put it over into the veins which can return it to the heart. Vessels will have three layers. So very important to remember the tunica intima, media, and externa. Obviously as the names imply you know the intima is going to be on the inside and the externa is going to be on the external surface. So the difference between the arteries and the veins is going to be that the arteries have thicker walls and a higher blood pressure than veins do. So therefore, the veins are going to still have the same three layers as the arteries, but they are going to be larger in regards to the actual diameter of the vessel. We'll see a comparison picture here in just a minute. And whenever you're looking at the veins, it's very important to remember that veins also have valves. So that is going to be incredibly important in ensuring that the blood can continue to flow in that low pressure system. It has something to help it along since that high pressure is no longer there. So here is an example of your artery. So in the picture on the left hand side you can see that it's the artery on the right hand side. You can see a comparison of the artery and the vein. So when we're looking at the artery again you can see your three layers the tunica intima, tunica media, and tunica externa. And what I want you to see on that tunica intima is that inner endothelium. So that endothelium is going to be incredibly important in maintaining homeostasis of the vessels. And I'm going to show you a few articles that talk about how important that endothelium really is. When you look at the lumen of the artery, of course it looks like it has a smaller diameter versus the lumen of the vein. And you can also clearly see that the artery is going to have a much thicker tunica media than the vein is. So here's your representation of the vein. Again, same three layers, and you still have that endothelium on the inner layer. So let's talk about the endothelium just a little bit, because previously, in a previous lecture, I did talk to you guys about how important it is to maintain proper blood glucose levels. Hyperglycemia is something that can really cause some damage to the internal lining of your vessels. It really interferes with the homeostasis inside of that endothelial layer. So let's look at some articles that can kind of go into that a little bit more because last time I said just trust me that glucose is really not going to be beneficial for that endothelial layer. Um, but now I'm going to show you some studies that talk about how that endothelial homeostasis cannot be maintained in the presence of consistent hyperglycemia. Let's first start with, we're going to start with this article right here. All of these articles are in your modules, so you can go to these articles at a later date if you so choose. But whenever you're reading an article, as you are looking at research, 
Sometimes it seems to be overwhelming when in fact all you have to really do is just break down the words and what are they trying to tell you. So use the knowledge that you have gained through your classes, um, biology, the anatomy and physiology one, and of course now anatomy and physiology two, in order to make yourself aware of what those research articles are saying. So here you can see it says endothelial cells. We just learned that that is going to be on that tunica intima, that endothelium layer. They control vascular homeostasis. We all know homeostasis is all about balance by generating paracrine factors. So we talked a little bit about paracrine factors in regards to the endocrine system that regulate vascular tone, inhibit platelet function. Platelets are those things that um, cause clotting. Prevent adhesion of leukocytes. So that's gonna be white blood cells since we haven't talked about the blood yet. And then limit proliferation of vascular smooth muscle. So it's limiting the ability of the smooth muscle to get out of control. The dominant factor responsible for many of these effects is endothelium-derived nitric oxide, NO. Endothelial dysfunction, characterized by enhanced inactivation or reduced synthesis of NO alone or in combination, is seen in conjunction with risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Endothelial dysfunction can promote vasospasm, not good, thrombosis, clotting, vascular inflammation, which is definitely going to be detrimental, and proliferation of the intima. Vascular oxidative stress and increased production of reactive oxygen species contributes to mechanisms of vascular dysfunction. So ROS, reactive oxygen species, is something that is going to cause issues within the vessels. If you do not maintain a good balance between your pro-oxidants and your antioxidants, um, there can be some issues with oxidative damage inside of the vessel walls. Let's look at another article. Type 2 diabetes is associated with a two to fourfold increased risk of both coronary heart disease and stroke. Dysfunction of endothelial cells, again, there's that word you just learned, is known to promote abnormal vascular growth such as that in atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis and has been postulated as an initial trigger of the progression of atherosclerosis in patients with diabetes mellitus, and hyperglycemia is an independent risk factor for the development of cardiovascular disease. So very important to really watch those blood sugar levels, not just for avoiding diabetes, but also for making sure that you are not interfering with homeostasis inside of those vascular walls that can then lead to things like atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis. Here again, you can see specifically endothelial dysfunction is associated with reduced NO production, anticoagulant properties, increased platelet aggregation, so clotting of things, increased expression of adhesion molecules, increased expression of chemokines and cytokines, we will talk about that whenever we get into the immune system, and increased ROS production from the endothelium. These all play important roles in the development of diabetic vascular complications, including atherosclerosis and other vascular pathologies. Importantly, endothelial dysfunction has been shown to be prognostic significance in predicting vascular events, so endothelial function testing may potentiate the detection of cardiovascular disease, such as myocardial infarction, peripheral vascular disease, ischemic stroke, and others. So what this is saying is, kind of what the other two articles are saying, if we have um, unchecked vascular homeostasis because of the issues with the nitric oxide not being produced at the level it's supposed to, and having an excessive amount of these reactive oxygen species that's causing problems within that endothelial lining, then we're going to have problems within our circulatory system. Now this one, specifically spoke about um, endothelial dysfunction shown to be uh, prognostic significance in predicting vascular events, so endothelial function testing may potentiate the detection of cardiovascular disease. So how would you do the testing? For those of you who are going into sonography, then you should be happy to know that eventually at some point in time, you will be able to learn how to do some of the testing that can actually tell if those vessels are healthy or if there is problems within a patient's circulatory system. So that carotid ultrasound will give you the ability to see inside of those carotid arteries and see what's going on 
on that inner layer. There's a couple of other things that you can do, but you see what I've highlighted on this is that endothelial dysfunction responds favorably to a healthful diet and exercise. Of course, whenever it all comes down to what should you do, there are so many things that food-based products can do. There's so many things that whenever you eat the right foods, then it's going to help your vascular supply incredibly, incredibly. So whenever you're looking at, well, what are the things that I should be eating? Always things that are closest to nature, things that grow in a field or on a farm, um, things that go moo, quack, whatever. Things that are close to nature, not things that come in a package, not things that come in a box, loaded with a ton of chemical ingredients, those are things that are going to interfere with vascular homeostasis and cause some dysfunction in that nitric oxide and then increase those reactive oxygen species. So anti-inflammatory foods are often very colorful, very healthy, very fresh, go to your farmer's markets, things of that nature are really going to be those things that are a healthful diet. And of course, exercising, there's so many things that you could do. There is a long list of exercises that anybody could talk about. And I know that there are some people, myself included, that don't like the traditional exercise. I don't want to get on the treadmill. I, I would rather, you know, stick a fork in my eye than go running um, just because that's how I am. But I will do other things like swimming, I absolutely love. Going to the trampoline park with my kids and then just jumping for hours at a time, I absolutely love that. That is good forms of exercise. So don't just limit yourself to what is the normal, let me go to the gym, because if that's not fun for you, you won't continue to do it. So you need something that's going to give you that motivation to continue on. Um, while we're talking about food, I'm also going to briefly mention the importance of magnesium because so many people are deficient in magnesium and don't even realize it. I do have another article here. The subclinical magnesium deficiency is a really big deal. And the reason why is because in most cases, the uh, magnesium deficiency is going to go undiagnosed. You can see here that first sentence says, because serum, blood, magnesium does not reflect intracellular, so what's on the inside of the cell, the latter making up more than 99% of total body magnesium, most cases will go undiagnosed. Furthermore, because of chronic diseases, so those lifestyle diseases, the choice diseases, because of chronic diseases, medications, decreases in food crop magnesium contents, and the availability of refined and processed foods, that's that box and packaged crap that I was just talking about, the vast majority of people in modern societies are at risk for magnesium deficiency. Certain individuals will need to supplement with magnesium in order to prevent suboptimal magnesium deficiency, especially if trying to obtain an optimal magnesium status to prevent chronic disease. Subclinical magnesium deficiency increases the risk of numerous types of cardiovascular disease, cost nations around the world an incalculable amount of healthcare costs and suffering and should be considered a public health crisis. So, this, you can see here, was published in 2018. There's been more work that's been done since then in regards to what is really the importance of magnesium. Magnesium does about 300 different things inside of the body, but whenever you have a patient who comes in with any type of cardiovascular risk or things that you may suspect as problems such as high blood pressure, then you definitely want to make sure that you're talking to that patient about the things that they are consuming and figure out if they're having magnesium inside of their diet on a regular basis. A lot of people do not get enough. Some people actually start to crave magnesium. You can see this very often in people who always want some form of chocolate. That can actually be a sign of magnesium deficiency. Now some people really just love chocolate, so maybe they don't have the magnesium deficiency, but it is one of those indicators that if you see that they have high blood pressure and they're constantly craving chocolate and maybe even some other things that show magnesium deficiency like mood disorders such as depression. And we definitely need to do some digger, uh, detect, digger, deeper and bigger detective work to dig around and figure out what's really going on with that patient in order to help them because cardiovascular disease is such a horrendous killer Anything that you can do to help that patient prevent and be proactive is always going to be helpful. So 
we cannot just say everything about the heart, 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 heart. We can't forget about the vessels because they are going to be so incredibly important as well. If the heart is pumping well, but there's lots of clots and lots of um, vessel disruption later on down in the piping that we have inside of our systems, then there's still going to be problems. So we definitely want to address all things for that particular patient. Okay, so when we're looking at the differences between the elastic, the muscular, and the arterioles, basically what's happening is as we go from really large vessels to smaller vessels, the structure is going to change. So our largest vessels are more elastic, like the aorta, because it's under a much higher pressure system. So we want to give it the ability to kind of stretch out and then go back to a recoil. So we would call these conducting arteries because they have to send blood um, very far away. So the muscular arteries are going to be our distribution arteries. These are the ones that are medium sized and that tunica media is going to have a lot of the muscle cells in order to help push that blood in the direction that it needs to continue to go. And then our arterioles are our resistance vessels. So these are small. They have little or no tunica externa and then very thin or incomplete tunica media. Remember, these are the ones that are going to feed into the capillary bed. So they're getting smaller. The structure is changing because the function is now also soon going to change. Looking at a picture as a comparison, again, you can see their elastic arteries are the larger ones, and then we move down until we get to the small capillary bed. Venules are also very small, and then we move up larger to get into the veins. We're going to be talking about capillaries specifically on a few slides from here. So whenever you're looking at your capillary bed, just keep in mind that this is the only place where you can have that functional exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So although all of the vessels are very important, we've got to ensure that the capillaries are also working really, really well. And if you look at that picture of the capillaries, you can see that it's just a single layer of endothelial cells which means that everything that we just learned from those research articles about the importance of the endothelial cells maintaining vascular homeostasis, if that's all the capillaries have to work with, then we absolutely need to make sure that we keep those vessels strong. If you have patients who come in with some circulatory issues, um, this goes beyond stroke, blood pressure, heart attacks, Circulatory issues can be system-wide. So I put this picture in here so that way you can remember, take your patient out of the box. If you see more than one thing going on, then you need to be the detective and start working towards what could be the issue with this particular patient. So lower back pain, people may not always associate with cardiovascular system or circulatory issues, but of course, this could be something that we need to look deeper into for this particular patient. Erectile dysfunction. Again, whenever we talked about the uh, male reproductive system, I'm, I stress the importance of having really good bedside manner and talking to males because they already don't want to come in in order to be seen. Um, they don't want people probing and prodding into their life. So whenever you do have someone who is there in front of you, Make sure that you do have that good bedside manner and let them know that you have a heart that says, I'm here to care for you and whatever it is that you need. Um, no shame, no guilt. There are some foods that I put over on the right hand side that you can eat to have healthier vessels. Garlic is my, one of my number one go-tos because garlic is good for so many things, not just the circulatory system, but also for the immune system and for the digestive system. But garlic will help kind of thin the blood out. So if there is some clogging going on, then it will help with increasing that blood flow appropriately. Asparagus, avocados, all the way down to CBD. So there's so many things that we could talk about with CBD. That's an entirely different lecture in and of itself, but very anti-inflammatory and really helpful in helping to make sure that you have that vascular homeostasis. Now, on this particular article right here for this website, um, this is one of the first paragraphs from that article. It says, researchers have discovered how diabetes, by driving inflammation and slowing blood flow, dramatically accelerates atherosclerosis. 
So I've already showed you some of the other research articles in regards to what happens when those endothelial cells cannot maintain homeostasis, especially in the presence of hyperglycemia. Um, but it's very important to stress that, again, experts once believed that atherosclerosis develops when too much cholesterol clogged arteries with those fatty deposits that people call plaques. However, it's now being shown that really what we're looking at is an inflammatory issue that has gone awry. So we're looking at something that goes beyond just cholesterol. So we don't wanna just blame cholesterol. Again, keep up with research. Make sure that you're paying attention to dates. If you're looking at something that is really, really far out and science has shown since then, that that's not completely accurate what we used to think and now with greater technology and greater avail availability to know things on a deeper level. Now if we find something else, then you need to keep up with that. So that's why it's very important to always pay attention to what's going on in research and not think that, well, I learned this and that's it, there is no more learning because there's constantly gonna be learning whenever you're in healthcare. You are always gonna be learning something new and the moment that you think you know it all, is the moment that you're probably gonna fall hard and hit your face, okay? Maybe even embarrass yourself. So don't, don't think that you are the greatest and the best, and even if you're super smart, all of that's wonderful, but stay humble and stay teachable. That's always incredibly important in the healthcare field. So if you have diabetes, as the research said, you're two to four times more likely to have cardiovascular issues, which can mean heart disease or stroke. So we definitely want to make sure that the diabetic patients truly understand what they are dealing with so that way they do stay compliant with taking care of themselves and making sure that they keep that hyperglycemia under control. What I want you guys to do is I want you to find a natural health article online that talks about diabetes, cholesterol, and heart disease. So there's a couple of questions that I have for you that I want you to answer. Again, I want you to pay attention to your dates, pay attention to your resources, really look at what you are kind of reading. The reason why I want it to be a natural health article is because those people who do not have health insurance as soon as you say something about going in to see a doctor, they immediately think, well, you, can't, you, I'm going to stop listening right there. You can't help me because I don't have the funds for that. Or some people are scared and they don't want to. So I want you to find a natural article of things that people can implement so that way they can take care of their vessels. So look at this from a big picture perspective instead of just pinpointing cholesterol as the problem. I want you to look at this as a bigger picture and understand holistically what's going on in patients whenever they're dealing with cardiovascular issues, either because of the diabetes, cholesterol, combination of the two, okay? Whenever we're looking at the blood flow, again, we have to have healthy blood flow, healthy vessels, blood flow to the brain is a top priority. The brain has a huge oxygen demand and so we always want to make sure that there's plenty of blood that is flowing up into the brain. A cerebrovascular accident, CVA, aka stroke, is whenever someone has a blockage or a rupture in a cerebral artery that stops the blood flow to the brain. Now there are issues within some of some people's vascular supply to their brain that we would call aneurysms. So aneurysms are these little bulges in arterial walls and they are more likely to rupture and then cause bleeding on the brain, which is um, potentially devastating. There is one in 50 people, they estimate, who have an unruptured um, aneurysm within their brain, which is pretty scary if you think about it, because at any point in time, that thing could just rupture and they would be in an emergency situation. There is one that will rupture every 18 minutes. That's a very scary statistic, but even worse is that ruptured brain aneurysms are fatal in about 40% of cases. Of those who survive, about 66% suffer some permanent neurological deficit. And then approximately 15% of patients die before reaching the hospital. So I have a picture up at the top of the little bulge within the brain. So that would be a brain aneurysm. The picture at the bottom, you can see that there is aneurysms 
that are along the abdominal aorta as well as the iliac artery. So you can have aneurysms, um, not just in your brain, but in other parts of your body as well. Abdominal aneurysms are often found on x-rays as a, oops, well, we were looking for something else, but look at what we found here. Um, that is kind of a common thing. So again, whenever it comes to keeping your vessels healthy, that is incredibly important and making sure you're eating foods that are gonna keep those vessels strong and functioning as they're supposed to. The anti-inflammatory foods, the healthy foods that are very often high in bioflavonoids are really good for vessel integrity. So eating foods really, really rich in bioflavonoids, super important. All right, capillaries. As I said, we were gonna talk about the capillaries um, on their own individual slide. I'm gonna show you a picture of what the three different types look like here in just a second. So just remember that this is the area where diffusion is going to be occurring so that we can get the oxygen out of the blood and into the tissues and then pick up the waste from the tissues and put it back into the blood. The capillary structure, again, is just an endothelial tube. There's no media, there's no externa, and the diameter is very similar to that of a red blood cell. The red blood cells are going to have to go through in a single file line in order to get to the capillary, get through the capillaries um, because that is how small they are. So here's your picture of the three different types of capillaries. We have a continuous, fenestrated, and sinusoid. The continuous, as the name implies, the layer is very continuous. There's not a lot of spaces or gaps for materials to come in and out of. Whereas a fenestrated capillary, as you can see in the picture there, there's fenestrations or what we would call pores. So there's more availability for things to move in and out of the capillary wall. And then in a sinusoid, there's large gaps there. So larger things have the ability to fit through the sinusoidal capillaries, whereas things um, that can fit through the sinusoids would never be able to go through a continuous capillary. So why would we have three different types of capillaries? Well, it all has to do with function, because remember, structure and function always are interrelated. They always go hand in hand. So when we're talking about a continuous capillary, this is going to be, again, that complete endothelial lining. This is found in all the tissues except epithelia and cartilage. And this is going to permit diffusion of water, very small solutes, and then lipid soluble materials. You do have specialized continuous capillaries within the central nervous system and the thymus, again, because you're gonna have a very restrictive permeability in continuous capillaries. So when you learned about the blood-brain barrier last semester in AMP1, you learned about something that was very restrictive and it did not allow certain things to go into the, blood, or the brain area. So the blood-brain barrier was very protected and that's what a continuous capillary has the capability to do. Whereas the fenestrated capillary, because of the pores, this is going to permit the exchange of other solutes. So larger solutes are going to allow to go through these fenestrated capillaries. There's a couple of different places where you can find the fenestrated capillaries. And then we have sinusoids. These are going to be the ones with the big gaps that are going to allow free exchange of water and large plasma proteins. So things like in the liver, um, when we get through the digestive system, then you will see the sinusoidal capillaries. The liver is very um, cleansing in nature. So there's a lot of things that are gonna go on in the liver that are all about cleaning things up. Um, so there's a lot of different things that can move through these sinusoidal capillaries as the liver works on doing those things. Because there's a lot of av availability for um, items, I can't even talk today, ions and large plasma proteins to move through the sinusoids, then you will have phagocytic cells at the sinusoids. Phago, think of that as Pac-Man. Pac-Man eats everything. Phagocytic cells, they eat stuff up too. So the phagocytic cells are going to work with our immune system to help make sure that everything stays within homeostasis balance and anything that looks like a pathogen or any cellular debris, it's really working on cleaning that up. That is the job of a phagocytic cell. Capillary beds will connect one arterial and one venule, and in the capillary beds, we have what are called precapillary sphincters. 
So sphincters guard the entrance to each capillary and then they are going to open and close, which was going to allow the blood to flow into certain parts of the capillary bed. If they close, then the blood is going to be diverted to a different part of the capillary bed. There are things within the capillary beds that are called thoroughfare channels, and that means that you can go from the arterial end to the venial end without going through different uh, port parts of the capillary bed. I'm sorry, I cannot talk today. So direct connection between the arterial and the venial is the thoroughfare channel. So here's a picture, and you can kind of see that thoroughfare channel, the one in the middle that directly links that arterial and that venule. There is the thoroughfare channel. You can see the little precapillary sphincters that are labeled here. So if these things constrict, then that means blood is going to be diverted around to a different portion of the capillary bed. Angiogenesis is the formation of new blood vessels. So genesis, creation of, um, angio, we're talking about the vessels. So new blood vessels, this is stimulated by VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. This is naturally going to occur in the embryo as it is developing and that is as it is growing for the 40 weeks. Um, but this can also occur in adults as well. This can occur in response to cells that are hypoxic, hypo meaning decreased, so hypo hypoxic means low oxygen levels. This is very important whenever we're talking about the heart because as we said in the previous PowerPoint regarding the heart, it's very important that it gets oxygenated so that it can continue to pump efficiently. So angiogenesis can occur in order to go around an occluded vessel so they can kind of create a new route so that there is still continuous blood flow. However, you can't change one thing in the body without changing another. So angiogenesis has been linked to promoting adipogenesis, which is the creation of new fat cells. If you have dysfunctional angiogenesis and inflammation occurring within that fat, then this is something that when it comes to cancer could be problematic. As cancer grows and develops, if it has new blood vessels to utilize, um, that can allow it to continue to flourish. So I put this article in here for you that talks about how angiogenesis can promote adipogenesis, which is not always going to be um, a good thing, obviously, and in some cases be quite detrimental to the body. Veins, we've already said that they are going to have larger diameters, thinner walls, lower blood pressure, and remember they have valves. So whenever you look at the valves, what you can see is that this is going to help those veins move the blood up against gravity. Let's say that the ankle, let's just take that part of the body, the ankle. Blood all the way down at the ankle is going to have to move up against gravity in order to get back up into the heart. But since the veins are a low pressure system, there's not enough pressure there to necessarily push it. So those valves will help it to move in the direction that it's supposed to. Because again, valves are for one-way flow. Venous pressure determines the amount of blood arriving at the right atrium each minute. Remember whenever we talked about the right atrium, the superior vena cava is going to drain into the right atrium. Inferior vena cava will drain into the right atrium. Coronary sinus will drain into the right atrium. All the blood that comes back into the right atrium each minute is known as venous return. Venules, we've already said these are very small veins. These are the ones that are going to pick up blood from the capillaries. Um, large veins, again, have all three layers. Okay. So remember, just depending upon the size will depend upon what the size of the vein will depend upon what's happening with those layers that are inside of the vessels. Superficial varicose veins, also known as spider veins, they don't look great, but they're not specifically harmful. I say specifically harmful, and I put a little asterisk there because if you have the varicose veins. That kind of shows that there has been some distension there and there may be some circulatory issues that are starting to set up. So even though the 
superficial spider veins aren't necessarily going to cause problems, it could signify that there may be deeper problems going on. And again, you want to make sure that you're eating those foods that are going to be healthy for your vessel integrity. DVT means deep vein thrombosis. This will affect deeper veins and it can cause the blood flow to slow, which can coagulate it. If this becomes a clot, aka a thrombus, then it will impair blood flow back into the right atrium. So if we're having problems with venous return, then of course that is definitely going to be an issue whenever it comes to cardiac output. If the clot dislodges and it moves off of the vessel and starts going through the bloodstream, then we would call it an emboli. And if that emboli lodges within the pulmonary circuit, then it can certainly become a problem as that patient has trouble breathing, they start to develop chest pains. So pulmonary embolism is not a good thing. Um, again, DVT, deep vein thrombosis, means that you can't always see these things. So here's my plug again for healthy eating, making sure that you're having things that are going to be really healthy for your vessels and help them maintain homeostasis is going to be paramount, as well as exercise. So whenever that blood is flowing appropriately like it's supposed to, it's less likely to get all sludgy, slow, and coagulate and cause things like that DVT. Okay, so here's the valves. Those are folds of the intima. So that inner lining will fold up. Again, the valves are to prevent the backflow of blood and the compression of the veins will help to push the blood up towards the heart. When the walls of the veins weaken, that's whenever you get those varicose veins, the spider veins, or hemorrhoids. So hemorrhoids is due to increased pressure within the venous system that causes the veins to swell and distend. Now, external hemorrhoids can be seen, they can be felt, um, sometimes they bleed and then people get a little scared whenever they see the blood on the toilet paper, but it's also possible to have internal hemorrhoids as well, where you can't necessarily see it and people don't always know that there's a problem, however, you still have that distension and that swelling within those veins. This is pretty common if you have someone who works a nine to five and they sit all day long and they hardly get up and move around or someone who deals with chronic constipation and they have to strain during their bowel movements that puts an increased amount of pressure on the veins that are in the lower pelvic cavity. So making sure that you know those patients kind of get a little bit of helpful hints for how to deal with things um, in order to help their vessels despite what they may be dealing with. So maybe if it's a, it's a job situation, then moving, getting a desk that will kind of stand up with you, taking frequent breaks, walking around, lots of different things that that person can do so that they don't have to continue to deal with that problem. So here's a picture of the valves. You can see the valves opening and closing. Again, the, the goal is to get the blood to flow up towards the heart and even though it's a low pressure system, the valves help push it in that direction. Now, as you can see, these veins are going to be surrounded by skeletal muscles. So this is why it's important to get up and to move around because the skeletal muscles contracting helps to ensure that the valves are working appropriately like they are supposed to and pushing the blood in that direction. Again, for that person who sits down all day, if they go home and they have swollen ankles at the end of the day, could be because they are not getting up and utilizing those skeletal muscle pumps as efficiently. Not only do you have skeletal muscle compression, but you also have a respiratory pump, which is going to help make sure that the blood is flowing appropriately like it is supposed to within the venous system. Now, for people who do stand throughout the day, or let's say like for example, um, one day whenever I was at church and the choir had just got finished singing and they had not yet left the stage, as the pastor was trying to say something, he kind of got a little long-winded and I guess one of the ladies had never been told to not lock her knees. If you're ever standing in a position for a good period of time, make sure that you continue to flex your knees 
don't don't lock them in an extended position because that doesn't allow your skeletal muscles to compress on those valves and allow the blood to return back up to your heart. So she stood with her knees locked in a position for too long and she did pass out on the stage. So once she passed out, she immediately came to because now the blood could rush up to her brain. So remember, it's very, very important for the brain to get plenty of blood. It has to have a lot of oxygen. So as soon as she went from a vertical position to a horizontal position, the blood went straight to her brain and she was up and awake and quite embarrassed, I'm sure. Poor thing. Okay, so the capacitance of a blood vessel is the ability to stretch and then recoil just like a balloon. This is going to cause a relationship between blood volume and blood pressure. Veins are known as our capacitance vessels because they have the ability to stretch more than arteries, up to eight times more than arteries. So therefore, they can act as blood reservoirs if that blood volume increases. They can hold on to extra blood. Systemic veins constrict, known as venoconstriction, in response to blood loss. So if there is, let's say, a motor vehicle accident and somebody has been injured and they're losing a lot of blood, then venoconstriction can occur in order to keep the blood volume within the arteries near a more normal level, even as that body is dealing with a significant blood loss. Whenever we're looking at where blood is going to be found, I have a little graph in the next slide, um, but a lot of people think heart arteries, that's where the majority of blood is, but that's actually false. 30 to 35% of the blood volume is gonna be in the heart arteries and capillaries, but majority of it, about 70% of it, is gonna be in the venous system because they are the capacitance vessels. So here's a little graph that basically breaks it down so that you can see Within the systemic venous system, you have 64%, pulmonary circuit 9%, heart 7, systemic arterial system 13, and then systemic capillary 7. So again, remember your venous system, because the veins can stretch more, they can be the capacitance vessels. They can hang on to more blood as reservoirs. And then if something happens, they can constrict and push blood into other vitally important areas like the heart or like in the systemic arterial system. Total capillary blood flow, so whatever is flowing in the capillaries should equal cardiac output. Whatever comes out of this heart should then end up in the capillary beds. That's the goal. Now this is gonna be determined by pressure and resistance within the cardiovascular system. Pressure is generated by the heart to overcome resistance. When we're talking about the pressure gradient, this is the difference in pressure from one end of the vessel, let's say from the aorta to the other end. So we talked in the heart about how this is the ascending aorta, which goes into the aortic arch, which goes into the descending aorta, thoracic aorta, abdominal aorta, common iliac. So as that moves down the body, that pressure gradient is gonna be different from the very beginning of the aorta all the way to the end. So the largest pressure gradient is found between the base of the aorta and then the proximal ends of the peripheral capillary beds. Flow is going to be proportional to the pressure gradient and then divided by resistance, which is known as R. So flow is directly proportional to the pressure, right? That makes sense because if you have increased pressure, then you're going to have increased flow. If I take my cup right here, and let's say I had a little table right here and I pushed my hand hard on this cup, then that's going to quickly move. High pressure, high flow. But if I barely push it at all, low pressure, hardly any movement, so that's gonna be low flow, okay? So flow is directly proportional to pressure. However, it is inversely proportional to resistance. Even if I push this hard, if somebody comes and puts their hand right here and they are stronger than me, they can provide a greater resistance, which means I'm now going to have decreased flow. So I may try to push hard, but I'm going to have this resistance that is meeting me that is going to cause my flow to actually decrease. I hope that makes sense. So when we measure pressure, we do so whenever we um, put the little pressure cuff 
on the arm, we're looking for what is the flow within the system. Blood pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury. It should be 120 millimeters of mercury at the entrance to the aorta, and then it goes down to 35 millimeters of mercury at the start of the capillary network. So that's the pressure gradient, the difference from the beginning to the end. Capillary hydrostatic pressure is the pressure inside the capillary beds. So the tiny little capillary beds that are the same diameter as a red blood cell essentially, inside of there they have capillary hydrostatic pressure. Along the length of the capillary, the pressure is going to decrease from about 35 millimeters of mercury to 18 millimeters of mercury. And then, remember we said the venous system is a very low pressure system. So pressure gradient from the venules, which is what the capillary bed is going to end in, is going to end in a venule. Pressure from the venules back up to the right atrium is about 18 millimeters of mercury. Low pressure system. 120 here, but once we get to the end of the capillary bed and we feed back up into the right atrium, that's only 18. Again, why we need those valves. Again, why we need to move in order to utilize our skeletal muscles to compress those valves to help the, vein, the veins return the blood back into the heart. Circulatory pressure must overcome total peripheral resistance. So this is resistance within the entire cardiovascular system. Across the systemic circuit, this is about 100 millimeters of mercury and it is affected by three things. So we have vascular resistance, blood viscosity, and then turbulence is the things that are going to affect the total peripheral resistance. So those three things we're gonna go through. Vascular resistance is due to friction. So remember that word friction between the blood and the vessel walls. So this is gonna be completely dependent upon how long the vessel is and then how wide it is. You're more likely to have friction between the blood flowing within a vessel wall if your vessel wall is about this big. If it's this big, then there's less likely to have friction because that blood is not going to bump up against the wall. However, if it's this big, then we're going to have more friction. Okay, so if the vessel diameter becomes smaller, then we're going to increase the vascular resistance. It's one of the issues with atherosclerosis is you're narrowing the vessel diameter. And then vessel length is also going to make a difference as well. Adult vessel length is pretty constant. As children go grow, their vessel length is of course going to change. So as you can see, there is an equation that's going to tell us that that resistance is going to increase exponentially as the vessel diameter decreases. So we're going to look at that on a picture in just a second. Blood viscosity. Think about this in regards to thickness, okay? If you think about the difference between clear water versus molasses, like in syrup, then you know that there is going to be a difference in that thickness. So that is the viscosity of that. So whole blood viscosity is about five times that of water, but it should not be thick like a super thick molasses maple syrup. Whenever you're looking at dehydration, this will cause an increase in viscosity. There are other things that can cause the blood viscosity to change as well. So just keep in mind that this is then going to affect our resistance. Turbulence. High flow rates, irregular surfaces, sudden changes in vessel diameter are going to upset smooth flow of blood, creating what we call eddies. And this swirling action will disturb that very smooth flow of liquid. So I put a little picture of the eddy on the slide for you because I just think that that looks so cool. Um, but this is going to occur whenever you have sharp um, changes in the direction of certain vessels. Like for instance, up near the area of C1, there is a very sharp change as the vertebral artery goes through that foramen within the C1 vertebral bone. So it can cause a little bit of turbulence in that particular area. Atherosclerosis can also cause turbulence as well. Turbulence will make a very distinctive sound. It's called a brewy. And so you can actually hear this with a stethoscope. 
Um, once you get used to listening to what normal blood flow should sound like, then you can also listen to what a brewy is going to sound like, and that is just issues with turbulence. So here's the picture I was going to show you. Again, the factors that are going to affect vascular resistance include how much blood is bumping up against that vessel wall, creating that friction. If you have a very short vessel, then it's less likely to cause friction compared to a long vessel. And the reason why is think about this. If you have a straw, like a normal drinking straw, and you put a little spit wad in it, and you try to shoot it out the other end, you're probably more than likely gonna see that spit wad come out because the straw is relatively short. If, however, you put a spit wad inside of a water hose, you're probably not gonna see the spit wad come out the other end because the length of that is so long that it's going to meet more friction and more resistance along the route of the water hose. So a smaller vessel length is gonna have less resistance to flow. A longer vessel length is gonna have an increased resistance to flow. And then we've already talked about the diameter. So the smaller the diameter, the more you're going to have a resistance to your flow. Whenever you're looking at turbulence, that's the very bottom picture, and you can see some of that swirling action that is occurring that is going to be causing some vascular resistance. If you do not have the capability to answer the question over on the left-hand side, then email me. If you're struggling with that and you can't quite figure out what it would be if you don't know for certain after we've gone through this little picture and all of the slides before, then feel free to shoot me an email so that way I can help you understand it and you can answer that question beyond a shadow of a doubt. Here is just a little chart. So for those of you who like charts, if you want to use this chart to kind of keep things um, in order as you're learning, then this is for you. Okay, for those of you who look at this chart and you're like, mm, I get everything you've already said, so this just overwhelms me, then don't feel like you have to use this. Okay. That last equation that we just talked about that um, was showing in the picture a little bit, resistance is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the vessel radius. That is the reason why whenever you look at the picture, you're going to see, for instance, right here, vessel length versus vessel diameter. If the diameter is two centimeters, the resistance to flow is one. If the diameter is cut in half, the resistance to flow increases exponentially. So that math is because of this equation right here at the bottom. That resistance is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the vessel radius. Okay, when we're talking about blood pressure, systolic pressure is going to be that peak arterial pressure during ventricular systole. Remember, systole means squeeze, so the systole is gonna be the contraction and the diastolic pressure. So ventricular diastole, remember that's going to be the state of rest and relaxation. The pulse pressure is the difference between the two. So the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. There's another way to measure it as well and we call that the MAP or the mean arterial pressure. Now this one is not gonna utilize two numbers. Instead there's an equation that is going to give you one number, and the goal is for that one number to be greater than 70 millimeters of mercury. Some cardiologists prefer to use this because it is going to be an indication of tissue perfusion. And remember, whenever we talked about cardiac output, it's all about how much blood can we get out of the heart in order to go into the tissues and bathe those tissues with the oxygen and the nutrients that they need. So you'll see there that the equation for MAP is the diastolic pressure plus the pulse pressure divided by three. Did a little equation for you there. You can see there down at the bottom how to obtain the actual MAP if you ever need to do that. Normal blood pressure textbook norm is known as 120 over 80. Some people will deviate a little bit from this, but you don't want them to deviate too far. Abnormally high blood pressure is generally considered to be anything 140 over 90 or greater. So whenever you're looking at hypertension, remember this means that you're not only increasing the workload on the heart, but you're also going to be negatively impacting vessel homeostasis 
So there's a lot of things um, that can happen whenever someone has hypertension that could be negative factors for their cardiovascular health, which is why we want to address it and take care of it. There are a number of different reasons for it, everything from food to sedentary lifestyle to stress. So we really have to figure out what it is for that particular patient to help them get it under control. Hypotension is abnormally low blood pressure. So the book says that this is anything 90 or 60 or less. However, I do want to say that there are people who should have blood pressure in the area of 120 over 80. And if they come up as, let's say, 100 over 70, although technically some books may not consider that to be hypotension for that patient, it very well could be. That's why it's important to keep track of health history, keep track of what have the vital signs been in the past. If you haven't had this patient before, obviously you're not gonna have access to that information. If you don't have medical records from a previous provider, but if you do, make sure you do pay attention to that because if it's consistently always 120 over 80 and then they come in and all of a sudden they're 100 over 70, just looking at them and saying, oh, you have great blood pressure. Um, if they have other signs of things, then you could be completely mistaken and you may be missing something. So just keep that in mind. I put a little link in here. For you if you are that person who consistently goes to the doctor and you really get a low blood pressure reading all the time if you're not an athlete then I highly encourage you to maybe look a little bit deeper if you have other health issues going on as to whether or not that actually is okay it may not be okay it could be a number of things anything from anemia to nutritional deficiencies um, so that's what that link is very easy to read very easy to share with patients because it's super easy for them to read as well so that way they understand the importance of high quality good blood pressure capillary exchange is of course vital to homeostasis because this is where you're going to be having the exchange function the materials are going to move across the capillary walls by diffusion filtration and reabsorption i put two videos here for you so i do want you to pause right here watch the two videos and then come back to this because I'm not going to play the videos right now. I want you to watch the videos, pause it where you need to, listen to it again where you need to, so that way you completely understand how capillary exchange is going to be working in regards to the dynamics between diffusion, filtration, and reabsorption. So I am going to go ahead and jump to slide 48, so that way I can talk about some of the big picture things that are occurring in capillary exchange. Okay, so filtration, think about your coffee filter. You put water into your coffee uh, maker. You put the coffee beans inside of the filter. The water is going to filter through and give you coffee in the pot. Reabsorption, you should have already learned from the video that that means that things are gonna be going back into the capillary. These two things are going to be affected by net capillary hydrostatic pressure and net capillary colloid osmotic pressure. So when you're looking at the factors that contribute to the net capillary hydrostatic pressure, we're talking about the CHP and the IHP. In red is the big picture here. This tends to push things out of the capillaries and into the interstitial fluid into the area where the tissues are. So we're moving it out of capillaries and into another area. Whereas the net capillary colloid osmotic pressure is going to move stuff from the fluid into the capillary. Okay, So one is going to push it out of the capillary, the other is going to push it back into the capillary. Now, however much we get out versus how much we get in is called the net filtration pressure. So this is going to be the difference between that net hydrostatic pressure and that net osmotic pressure. There is an equation for it right there, but what I really want to show you is this picture that is going to describe how we're going to have 24 liters of fluid that, or blood that's going to be filtered per day but we're only going to have a reabsorption of 20.4 liters per day. So that means that leaves us 
with fluid that doesn't all get returned to the capillary bed. And because all of that fluid does not get returned to the capillary bed, then that means that some other system is going to have to pick it up, and that is going to be your lymphatic system. Very important to remember that because when we get into the lymphatic system, if you forget that this is the fluid that is not being pushed back into the capillary bed at the venule end, you'll kind of be confused as to where did this come from? I don't even know what's happening right now. So this is something for you to keep on your mind for future reference. Not everything that is pushed out of the capillary bed is going to return to the capillary bed. So pushing fluids out in order to bathe the tissues with oxygen and nutrients, and then we're going to put fluids back in because we don't want to just keep all of the fluid out of the tissue. That will create pockets of edema all over the body. So we want to pull it back into the capillary bed, put it in the venules to return it back up into the heart so that we can keep the blood flow consistent and maintain that good cardiac output. Any that's not picked up and put back into the capillary bed is going to go into the lymphatic vessels and then ultimately become what we would call lymph. Okay? Alright, so tissue perfusion, as I've said multiple times, this is key. Ultimately, what we need to do is we need to bathe those tissues. Tissue perfusion is going to be affected by cardiac output, which is what we learned the last time, peripheral resistance, which is what we talked about today, and then of course blood pressure. When certain cells become active, circulation to that region has to increase. Of course, cardiovascular regulation will ensure that the blood flow changes will occur at the right time in the right area without stealing from other important organs like the brain. Arteries, elasticity, allows them to absorb pressure waves that come with each heartbeat, so contractility allows the arteries to change diameter. This will be controlled by the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. So vasoconstriction, this is when you're going to have contraction, that's your fill in the blank, contraction of the arterial smooth muscle, and vasodilation is when you have relaxation of the arterial smooth muscle. Of course, the relaxation means that you will enlarge the lumen and, of course, decrease your total peripheral resistance. Vasoconstriction and vasodilation are going to affect the afterload on the heart. Uh, we also talked about this in the third portion of the heart PowerPoint, so if you do not remember what afterload is, go back and review that a little bit the peripheral blood pressure, and then the capillary blood flow. Vasomotion is the contraction and relaxation cycle of the precapillary sphincters. This causes blood flow in the capillary beds to constantly change routes. We're constantly going to be bathing these tissues. So vasomotion, just remember that, is the contraction and relaxation of the precapillary sphincters. There's a couple of ways to control cardiac output and blood pressure. They include autoregulation, neural mechanisms, and endocrine mechanisms. I've got videos for you there for the autoregulation as well as for the neural mechanisms. So I want you to pause, watch those videos, and I'm going to jump straight into the endocrine mechanisms because those videos do a pretty good job talking about the autoregulation versus the neural. On this particular picture, before I jump to the endocrine, I just want to show you, again, those precapillary sphincters are going to be involved in autoregulation. So that autoregulation automatically regulate in the local area, so this can change the pattern of blood flow within the capillary beds depending upon which sphincters relax and contract, what, which ones open and close, okay? And... We're going to skip to slide 69 in order to get into our endocrine mechanisms. So endocrine mechanisms, we learned about the endocrine system in the very beginning of this semester. Hormones have short-term and long-term effects on the cardiovascular regulation, for example, epi and norepi from the adrenal medulla will stimulate cardiac output and peripheral vasoconstriction. So, thought processes and emotional states have the ability to elevate blood pressure by cardiac stimulation and vasoconstriction. This is one of the reasons why whenever people are highly stressed, 
Um, if they are OCD, they burn the candle at both ends, they can end up with high blood pressure because it is going to cause that cardiac stimulation and that vasoconstriction that is going to increase the blood pressure. So mindfulness and meditation are really helpful to that particular patient group in order to help them learn how to use biofeedback to rest and relax and then come back to a more um, homeostasis. ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Remember, this is going to be released by the posterior lobe of the pituitary, even though it is made in the hypothalamus. The goal of ADH is to reduce any water loss at the kidneys. And if we hold on to water, then what we can do is we can make sure that we can increase blood pressure if needed. So if there is a low blood volume, then ADH will be released in order to hold on to the water in order to increase the volume, which will in turn increase pressure. High plasma osmotic concentration, aka low sodium, is another thing that ADH is going to respond to. So if there is low sodium, then remember in general terms, the water will follow salt. So if there's not enough sodium, then won't be enough water. We release ADH, keep the water. This will also be released in response to circulating angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is released in response to decrease in blood pressure, specifically renal blood pressure, so in the kidneys. This will stimulate aldosterone, ADH, thirst, and cardiac output and peripheral vasoconstriction. So if you think about thirst, this is going to be something that can stimulate angiotensin 2 because thirst would make that person drink the water, which if we increase volume, again, we can increase pressure. Erythropoietin is released by the kidneys. This will respond to low blood pressure or low oxygen content in the blood, stimulates vasoconstriction as well as red blood cell production. Yes, there are athletes who do the doping with erythropoietin in order to get more red blood cells because more red blood cells means more oxygen. More oxygen means you can go harder, faster, longer than your competitor, which means you're more than likely going to win. But this is a natural hormone that is released by the kidneys when there are hypoxic situations that are detected. Here is some of your graphs that will show you the different things that can uh, cause a return to homeostasis if it is disturbed for a particular reason. Naturitic peptides, we have ANP and BNP, so the atrial are going to be produced by the cells in the right atrium, and the BNP are going to be produced by the ventricular muscle cells. These will respond to excessive diastolic stretching. They reduce blood volume and blood pressure. So all the other hormones that we have been talking about they are going to increase blood volume and blood pressure. These two are going to reduce blood volume and blood pressure because they are getting a sense that there is too much stretching, which means the blood volume or pressure is too high. And then there is your little graph for that. Long-term restoration of blood volume, recall of fluids from interstitial spaces, aldosterone and ADH promote fluid retention and reabsorption, Thirst is going to increase, and then that EPO will stimulate those red blood cells. Again, your graph for that. Any situations with shock are a failure to restore blood pressure to appropriate levels. So this is going to be a situation if a person is losing a lot of blood and that blood just cannot be restored, that pressure cannot be restored to the normal levels that it should be then that person can go into shock. Um, a very scary situation to be in, so again, this is why you always wanna to try to act quickly and address emergencies as fast as, as fast as possible. Okay, so let's talk about fetal and maternal circulation. Because we've been talking about all of the blood vessels that are going to be in a normal human adult, but whenever we talk about the fetus, it's gonna be a little bit different. Now remember when mom gets pregnant, baby implants within the uterus, what is going to set up is that temporary organ that's called the placenta. So that's going to be the connection between mom and baby. And of course, 
baby will be connected to the placenta via the umbilical cord. So there's going to be a lot of functions that are going to be provided for the baby through the placenta. I put a couple of YouTube videos on this PowerPoint for you. You do not have to watch them if you do not want to. But the placenta is an amazing structure. There's so many wonderful things that it does and it's just really cool to learn about, especially if you are going to be working in like L&D or in pediatrics or in the NICU. So here's what I do wanna say before we get into the information on fetal blood circulation is that unless there's gonna be cord blood banking, I highly encourage everybody to seriously consider prolonging the cord cutting at birth. And the reason why is because as the baby is born into the world, obviously it's a very traumatic experience, but as the baby comes into the world, still connected to mom via that umbilical cord, that blood is still gonna to continue to pulse through that umbilical cord and get into baby. So staying connected for a few minutes and not just trying to immediately cut the cord is going to give the baby some time to kind of acclimate to the world before it's just immediately cut off from mom. I think that this is incredibly important in so many different situations, um, but I personally, I will say, I have been in a situation where this was vital. So whenever I had my daughter, I'll make this short, short story. Um, whenever I had my daughter, she was born and I was in a position that basically what happened was because my water did not break and I was on all fours as I was delivering her, um, the midwife actually put her underneath me and passed her to my husband who was in front of me. So the midwife was behind me, my husband was in front of me and as my daughter came out, she cried and as she opened her mouth to cry, it was then that my water broke. And so my water, uh, the amniotic fluid ended up getting inside of her mouth. And then she passed her on to my husband and my husband took her. And then of course I sat down, I took her. And as soon as I took her, I knew there was something wrong. Like I, this is my third child. So I knew that there was an issue. And as I was holding her, I looked up at my husband and I said, this is not right. Something is wrong. And so my husband tried to talk to the midwife and say, hey, there's a problem. There's something going on. And she was busy taking her notes. She was not paying attention. And she said, oh, she's fine. She cried. She's just resting right now. And I looked at my husband and I said, no, no, that's not. And I do not accept that answer there is something wrong. And so my husband said, no, she's saying that there is something wrong. So can you come and look and check? And she did not come over. And so my husband went over there and said to her, touch her on the shoulder, I need you to come over here. And as soon as he was in the process of doing that, charisma started turning blue. And it was a very scary situation. I laid her on the bed in front of me. I put my hand over her chest and I just immediately started praying. And I was praying that he breathed the breath of life into her. And I prayed over her lungs and I prayed over everything else. As the midwife was scrambling and telling my husband to grab the black thing with the thing that goes in your ears. And the crazy part about that was that she knows that I was a doctor and I have a health background so obviously my husband is going to have some knowledge some working knowledge of what's going on um, he's gone through paramedic school and fire school so he understands things so the fact that she was trying to describe something my husband just screamed out do you mean the stethoscope and she was like yes get the stethoscope and so he grabbed the stethoscope and she was getting the oxygen machine but charisma was still attached to me so the blood was still pumping into her, but she was quickly losing the battle because she could not breathe. And so I continued to pray. The oxygen machine got put on Charisma, and thank God uh, she started to cough, and the fluid started to come out, and she's okay to this day. Um, but we have told her this story, so that way she knows how incredibly special she is. And that way she knows the power of prayer, because it did not take long for her to stop the blue and to come back. Um, so her hypoxia 
was relieved and we, you know, left there within two hours. Um, could not wait to get out of there, I'm not going to lie. Um, so I say that to say that there are situations that people take for granted and they may not always realize when an emergency may arise. So do not feel like the cord has to be immediately cut. We did immediately cut it for our second son because we did do the cord, bl cord blood banking. And that was important for us to do at that point in time. But once you have it for one child, you don't need to get it for multiple. So since we had it for him, thank God we were able to keep Charisma connected. She had a little bit of my blood flow. Um, but we are so gracious that she is here with us to this day. It was a very scary situation. Um, but again, like I said, we have told her so that way she knows that she um, is an amazing, strong fighter. And every once in a while, whenever she gets a little tired as she's doing soccer or something like that, she'll tell me, Mom, I feel I'm like I can't breathe and I think I might have a little bit of that fluid left in my chest. And I'm like, girl, if you don't quit, stop that right now. So, um, she's super sweet. Love her so much. So, just keep that in mind because um, that could be helpful for babies um, that you may have to deal with in the future. So that placental blood flow, again, the blood is going to flow from placenta to the baby via the umbilical cord. So it's going to go through a single umbilical vein, which is actually oxygenated. So here's another particular instance where you're going to have a vein that has oxygenated blood in it, although you're normally used to seeing veins that have deoxygenated blood. And then this is ultimately going to empty up into the inferior vena cava. It, the umbilical cord also has a pair of umbilical arteries, which are deoxygenated. The placenta is going to have numerous functions beyond blood flow. So it's going to secrete HCG, that hormone that will detect a pregnancy. It will secrete the HCG to feed the corpus luteum, to maintain the progesterone levels until the placenta can produce its own supply of progesterone to help mom carry a full term. Remember when we talked about endocrine system, we talked about the importance of progesterone. So this will ensure adequate blood flow to the baby and also secretes estrogen to keep the uterus supple and soft. So that placenta is so incredibly important. Before birth, the fetal lungs are collapsed. So that oxygen is completely provided by that placental circulation and the fetal pulmonary circulation is going to bypass. A couple of different structures are going to be different within the fetal heart. So let's talk about those. Whenever we're looking at the heart in the fetus, there is a structure that's called the foramen ovale, also known as the intraatrial opening. The foramen ovale is going to move blood from the right to the left atrium. And the reason why we move it from the right to the left atrium is because remember, there's really no reason to go into the lungs since the baby is in amniotic fluid and they're not breathing external air. So there's really no reason to go from the right atrium to the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk into the pulmonary arteries in order to go into the lungs to pick up oxygen. So the right to left movement of the blood within the atriums is done through that foramen ovale. Now by natural gravity, some of that will kind of flow down into the right ventricle and then end up in the pulmonary trunk. So any of that blood that does do that is then going to be able to be shifted from the pulmonary trunk straight to the aorta. So again, we can bypass that fetal pulmonary circulation since the baby is living in amniotic fluid. So very important to know those two structures, the foramen ovale and the ductus arteriosus. Those are openings that only are going to occur in the fetus. Those are not going to occur in the adult, or at least they shouldn't. So we'll get to some pathology here in just a second. But that foramen ovale, when the baby is born, is going to immediately close. So that pressure signifies that as the baby is coming through the vaginal canal, that pressure is going to help close off the foramen ovale and the ductus arteriosus. And the foramen ovale will become the fossa ovalis. The ductus arteriosus will become the ligamentum arteriosum. So here you can see a picture of that sweet, sweet baby. The maternal and the fetal blood, although it says in um, many textbooks that they do not mix, 
there is going to be some intermingling of that fetal and maternal blood and they have actually found fetal cells inside of or excuse me I should say the baby's cells inside of a mom who has already delivered given birth no longer pregnant years and years and years later so although a lot of textbooks will say the blood does not mix there is some intermingling between that blood because they are now finding different moms who have their baby cells within their body still years after the baby has been born which is incredibly cool um, lots of different studies that are looking into how does this change things within mom so I just think that that is so super fascinating all right um, another video for you if you want to watch that video in regards to the placenta and how baby can tap into mom's blood supply in order to get that really good oxygen whenever the newborn breathes air then the lungs are going to expand because remember while the baby is in the womb the lungs are collapsed whenever the lungs expand then the pulmonary vessels will expand this is going to reduce the resistance and increase the blood flow and then the rising oxygen will cause that ductus arteriosus constriction rising left atrium pressure closes the foramen ovale and now the pulmonary circulation can work like it's supposed to this is why it's so important for babies to cry whenever they are born so that way it can help expand their lungs and allow their blood to flow in the direction that it should so as soon as they're born immediately once all those structures close up now they have the circulation just like an adult like we talked about in the heart like you drew in the structures um, for your heart diagram as soon as the baby is born that's what it all switches over to okay so now if you look at this picture you can see the foramen ovale is now closed the ductus arteriosus is now closed those become the fossa ovalis and the ligamentum arteriosum respectively but what happens if they don't close like they're supposed to well we can get what's called a patent foramen ovale patent means that it stays open so it doesn't close like it's supposed to so in patent foramen ovale then the blood recirculates through the pulmonary circuit instead of entering the left ventricle so we call this a left to right shunt if you look at this particular picture this shows you patent foramen ovale and patent ductus arteriosus so again patent remaining open if both of them remain open then there's definitely going to be circulatory issues and patent ductus arteriosus we call this a right to left shunt and so the skin uh, will start to develop as blue um, this is an indication of cyanosis the infant will be known as the blue baby now in my daughter's case this was not the issue for her it was because she swallowed water and she could not breathe so it wasn't a patent ductus arteriosus it was a problem with the obviously fluid inside of the lungs tetralogy of Fallot is going to be a number of different heart and circulatory defects that will affect 0.1% of newborn infants you can see in the picture that there are a number of different things that are going to occur such as the um, pulmonary trunk being really really narrow we have an interventricular septum that is not correct is not set up as it should be there is no division between the right and the left ventricle because the septum is remaining open and then the aorta originates where the interventricular septum normally ends so got lots of different things that could be going on that are then going to cause circulatory issues in a baby with tetralogy of Fallot ventricular septal defect again this is an opening in that septum that should separate the right and left ventricles but because it is open then there is no separation remember we want to keep oxygenated and deoxygenated blood separate on their respective sides so that everything works properly in the pulmonary circuit as well as the systemic circuit another problem would be the atrioventricular septal defect so this is where both atria and ventricles are incompletely separated this could be because a patient or excuse me a child has down syndrome so um, this type of defect most commonly will affect infants who have down syndrome which is unfortunate transposition of the great vessels i've only ran into a few people who have ever seen this a few students 
when I say people, I mean students who have ever seen this in their jobs, but whenever they see it, it is quite cool. So not necessarily cool for the person who is affected by the transposition, but what happens is the aorta is connected to the right ventricle instead of the left ventricle. So obviously transposition, they are transposed. They are not where they are supposed to be. As you can see in the picture, it kind of goes up very straight where you know that it should be more of a twist. So we want the actual aorta to be connected to the left ventricle, not to the right ventricle. Cardiovascular capabilities will decline with age and age-related changes will occur in the blood, the heart, and the blood vessels. There's a couple of different things that are going to be age-related, but although textbooks will say these are age-related changes, keep in mind that if you are nourishing your body, you do not have to look like your age or feel like your age. Really, whenever we're looking at people who do not age well, it's generally situations where they have not allowed adequate rest and repair time for their bodies or they've not fed their bodies very well so the cellular metabolism does not work like it's supposed to anymore and homeostasis is disturbed in a number of different ways. So although this may be common um, and people would even say that this is normal, just keep in mind that you can break the rules of the norm if you do things differently. Disorders of the cardiovascular system, of course, can affect many cells and systems because we are depending upon this system to bring blood to all of the other tissues of the body. It could be from disease, could be from trauma, could be structural, could be functional. So lots of different things that can occur that could go wrong. Have a great day.